mid-77 Hudson. And I'm just doing a orientation here with Gary, the homeowner of 1713. And I'm just gonna go through a little bit of use and care um, on the different products in the home here. Um, how things work, how they operate, and some do's and don'ts on things as well. Um, so we'll start off here in the kitchen. Uh, your lights in your kitchen are going to operate off these switches here. You have under cabinet lights which work off this switch. And then you also have hi-hats which work off this switch here. You also have a switch located over here which is going to operate your hallway lights. And you also have one more switch that has a red dot next to it. And that switch is going to operate a switch outlet which coordinates with the red dot of this outlet over here on this wall. So for instance, if you would have a lamp plugged into this outlet with this red dot, it's going to allow you to turn the lamp on and off with that switch. So, so we'll get into light bulbs a little bit. Um, I'll show you how to change the under cabinet lights just because they are a little trickier than obviously the hi-hats which are Pretty much anybody would know how to change those. Your under cabinet lights, if you look where my fingernail is, it's on a little plastic ledge right here at the under cabinet lights. This little plastic ledge is flexible. So when I bend this back, the glass is going to drop down right like that. And it allows me to access the under cabinet lights inside here. The lights that are located in here, they're bi-pin halogen light bulbs. They do get very hot, so you do not want to touch them when they're on or it will burn your hand. Um, bi pin light bulbs, meaning two pins, you pull them straight out, push them straight in, change them. You can get these light bulbs at Home Depot, Lowe's, any hardware store. It's a 20 watt max on these light bulbs. To put the glass back up, same thing, push the ledge back so it catches the glass like so. That's how you put it back up. Um, your refrigerator, which you have here, it's a LeBaire refrigerator. Your control buttons are up top here. You have on and off buttons for your refrigerator and your freezer. Just make sure if you do turn the unit off, obviously you want to take the food out of it and also empty your ice tray and your freezer because you don't want that to melt and have water go all over the floor. So, uh, it also has temperature controls. You can adjust the temperature up and down with the arrow buttons here. Manufacturer recommends 37 for the refrigerator, and the manufacturer recommends zero for the freezer. It also has a super frost and a super cool feature. And what that's for is if you're gonna be going to the grocery store and you're gonna be buying a lot of groceries and you're gonna have the door open for a long time, it's sort of like a turbocharged cool down of the unit. So it's basically gonna get the unit back to temperature a lot quicker. Um, it's just an added feature that LeBaire has with the refrigerator. You'll also see on the refrigerator it has an alarm button at the top here. Basically the alarm on your refrigerator and freezer would go off for two reasons. One reason being if you leave one of the doors open, the alarm will go off. The other reason is if the temperature inside here gets too warm. It'll start to beep to let you know that there's, there's an issue the temperature in here is getting too warm. So if the alarm does go off, um, you can just shut the door and it'll stop on its own. Also in your refrigerator, your shelves are all adjustable. You can move these to any height you want to. Same thing with your dividers. These dividers here clip off. You can move these to wherever you want in here as well. Your freezer. In your freezer, you have an ice maker, which is located at the top left. It fills this compartment up with ice. Um, about the first maybe two or three times it makes ice, you probably want to empty it just because it's a new, um, a new refrigerator just to clean out the system. So we'll empty it here. If I wanted to turn this off, I hold this in for about three seconds and the light goes off. So the only reason you would need to turn it off is just if you never wanted it to make ice. 
The ice maker does not have a filter built into it, so the water that is coming into this is just regular tap water. So we'll leave the ice maker on for now. The ice maker does sense that, it, that this compartment gets filled with ice and stops making ice automatically. So you don't have to worry about it overflowing or overfilling with ice or anything like that. Also on here you'll see there's two to six, four to eight, six to 12 on each of these compartments. And what that's representing is weeks. So, for instance, it's saying 6 to 12 weeks, fruits and vegetables, frozen fruits and vegetables will last 6 to 12 weeks. It's just giving you a guide for how long those types of things with uh, those types of foods would last in the freezer. So, um, other thing I just wanted to show you is with the refrigerators, you'll notice the doors are not self-closing. So, anytime you are getting something in and out of the refrigerator or freezer, please make sure you are closing the door the whole way. Um, another thing people have a tendency to do is when they close the freezer door, they'll let it swing close and it'll bounce back open and stay open maybe like an inch or so, and then everything in the freezer melts and then you have water all over your floor. So just make sure you're shutting the door completely on the freezer and refrigerator. Um, the cabinets that you have, your upper cabinets have glass shelves in them. You want to be careful about storing metal pots and pans up here just because it's easy to chip these edges of these glass shelves. It's best to get like a cabinet liner to protect these to prevent any chips or scratches on your shelves. You can adjust the heights of the shelves simply by moving these pegs here um, up or down so you can adjust the heights to whatever you want. In your backsplash, you'll see you have outlets all through your backsplash here. These outlets are called GFI outlets. GFI stands for Ground Fault Interrupter. They're required by code in any wet area. And wet area obviously being your kitchen. And you'll also see these outlets in your bathroom as well. And what they're for is if you would have an appliance plugged into one of these outlets, or let's say in the bathroom you have a hair dryer plugged into the outlet in the bathroom, and the hair dryer appliance falls into the water, it'll trip in a sense, kill the power so you don't electrocute yourself. Um, it's a safety feature. So when it does trip, you'll see the little red light comes on here. That's how you know that there's no power to this outlet right now. So to reset it, there's a reset button. You just push that back in and it resets. Now you'll notice the outlets here don't have the button on them. But the way it works is it's all ran off the same electrical line going through the backsplash. So even though this one doesn't have the button, this one still trips as well because it's ran off the same electrical line going around the backsplash. So um, your floating shelves in your in your unit here. Now these are called floating shelves obviously because they're not attached in any way. They're sort of floating in there in a sense. One thing with these floating shelves is you want to be careful about overloading these with too much weight. Now, when I say too much weight, you don't want to stack a thousand cookbooks up here. What we recommend is about 10 to 15 pounds max on these shelves because what happens is if you overload them with too much weight, over time they'll start to sag. Um, sag and uh, they won't be uh, level. So, your hood that you have here, Control buttons are right underneath. You have a switch for lights right here. So you can turn the lights on and off. You also have an on off switch for the fan. And then there's also a switch for the fan high low. So right now I have the fan on low. And then I can switch it over to high as well. Also with the hood, the hood is recirculating. In other words, it's just sucking the air in through two filters and just blowing it back out into the home. It does not vent outside the building. So the two filters it has, show you here. You'll see the two filters, one is black in color and one is silver in color. Now the silver one is your grease filter. This is the one that's going to be located on the bottom and it's going to capture all the grease that gets sucked up into your fan. It'll get caked with 
yellow grease and you can actually clean the grease filter by sticking it in the dishwasher. The charcoal filter, the black filter, this is the one that's going to help neutralize the air and help take out the smells out of the air. This one you can't stick in the dishwasher. Um, it should last about four to five years with normal cooking use. And again, it depends on what type of cooking you do. Um, you know, someone who cooks with uh, a lot of different spices or really potent uh, spices, you know, you might have to change it a little bit more often. Um, you know, someone who doesn't cook much or if you don't run the fan much, then, you know, obviously it's going to last longer. So, it depends what type of, uh, what type of cooking you do and how much you actually cook. So, the charcoal filter is going to go in first up on top. And you'll see in here there's two ledges. So the top ledge is where the charcoal filter goes. And then the bottom ledge is where your grease filter goes. Now the grease filter, you'll notice that there's two sides to it. I always tell everybody to put the prettier and nicer looking side facing down. So the charcoal filter, it doesn't matter which side you have up or down. So. Um, your cooktop, which you have here, your cooktop is a Bosch cooktop. To turn the burners on, you're going to press down and turn over at the same time. So your biggest burner is on the left here. This is pushing out about 12,000 BTUs. Your second biggest burner is pushing out about 10,000, then to 8,000, then to we get that right, 12, 10, 8, yeah, and then down to uh, 6. The other thing that's great about the cooktop is it has a built-in safety feature. Um, let's see if I can demonstrate it here. If you can hear the gas hissing out here, the cooktop actually recognizes it doesn't light and it shuts the gas off automatically. So if a kid would ever reach up here and turn the knob over, or you would bump the knob over for some reason and the gas starts hissing out, it shuts off automatically so you don't fill your home up with gas and have an explosion. So it's a good safety feature they have to limit through these cooktops. The other thing is these grates also come off. So you can actually clean these grates in the dishwasher. Um, and also it gives you better access to clean the cooktop area as well. The burners come off as well. You can take the burner tops off as well as the metal piece underneath here to clean any food that might spill down and around the burner here. Um, when you put the burner back on, you'll notice in the top here, there's a little hole at the top of this burner. What you want to do is put this white peg down through that hole. And then I usually just give it a little wiggle to make sure it's on nice and secure. And then same thing when you're putting the top back on. Give it a little wiggle and make sure it's on nice and secure. If your top's not on straight, you'll notice because the flame comes out crooked, the flame doesn't come out nice and even. So that's how you can tell if it's on if it's on straight or not. It's coming out nice and even. So. The other thing with your cooktop and also your hood, it's stainless steel. Now the best thing to use to clean stainless steel is stainless steel cleaner. You can buy it. In Grocery stores sell it, Home Depot, Lowe's, Bed Bath & Beyond, any place like that would sell it. Um, but the one important thing about cleaning stainless steel is, when you look at stainless steel, you'll notice it looks like there's grains or lines that run in a certain direction. So, for instance, on the hood here, these grains run up and down. So when you clean stainless steel, you would always want to rub with the grain. You would never want to rub against the grain. And the reason is because if you have fine particles of dirt or anything in the paper towel, it'll put little scratches going across the stainless steel. So make sure you rub up and down with the grain when you're cleaning stainless steel. So your cooktop here, your cooktop the grains are actually running left to right. So you always want to rub left to right with your cooktop. So the oven which you have here it has three racks in here. And you also get a broiler pan if you want to do any cooking. The bottom rack here rolls out as well. Now, 
let's say you wanted to use the oven and bake in the oven. So let's say I wanted to bake something at 400 degrees. So I would press cooking mode right here, and you'll see it flashes bake. Now I can adjust this. I can change what's flashing by turning this knob right here. So I can turn it to broil, convection bake, convection broil, convection roast, clean, warming, fast preheat bake, fast preheat convection bake, dehydrate, and back to bake. So let's say I wanted to bake something at 400 degrees. So I'm on bake, then I would press temperature, and now temperature is flashing. So I'm just going to turn the knob to 400 degrees, right there, and then I'm just going to hit start. And that's going to start the oven to bake. Now obviously it's not 400 degrees in here yet, and I know that because of the preheat um, right here on this screen that's saying preheat. So once it gets to 400 degrees, this will go away and it'll actually beep to let me know that it is 400 degrees inside the oven. So if I wanted to shut the oven off, I would just press cancel and that would shut the oven off. So, um, what else? Your sink, located here, your sink is going to turn on simply by moving the handle out. You're going to have hot water to the front, and then you're going to have cold water to the back. And then in addition, you can pull out your faucet here, and by pressing this in, it's going to create the water to go into the spray mode. Like that. So. Now the other thing about your sink is, your sink does not have a garbage disposal, so you're not going to want to shove food or anything down your sink. Um, obviously, if you shove food down your sink, it's going to get clogged, it's going to clog the drain, and you're going to need to unclog it. So, don't shove any food or anything down your sink. Um, your sink does have a sink strainer that you can press down in and fill your sink up with water. One thing you just want to be careful with in doing that is there's no overflow on a kitchen sink. So, if you do uh, press something down in the sink strainer down in your sink, and you're filling it up, make sure you shut the water off before it goes out over the top because it can obviously overflow and flood out the home if you don't do that. So it's very important. Um, dishwasher, which is located here. Now your dishwasher, your control buttons are here on this uh, top panel here. So let's say I wanted to do a load of dishes in my dishwasher here. So this top tray is where you're going to put your utensils. You lay them in here on this top tray. The second tray here is where you're going to put your cups, glasses, bowls, things like that. And then the bottom is obviously where you're going to put your pots, pans, plates. You're going to put them down here. Now the soap, the detergent, is going to go in this compartment right here. And then you're just going to close the lid. And if you use Jet Dry or Rinse Aid, you can put it in this compartment here. And just close the lid. All right. So I have all. Let's just pretend I have all my glasses, my cups, my dishes, everything in here. I put my soap in, my Jet Dry in. So I'm going to turn it on. And the on/off button is right here. So the straight line down is your on button, and the circle would be your off button. So let's say I want to just do a normal wash of my dishwasher. So if I want to do a normal wash, I need to move this light over to this side so it lines up with normal. And I can move this light by just pressing the program button. So if you see me press this button, this light here will move. So you can see I moved it over to normal. Now you'll notice on here, the rinse aid, it has a red light right next to it. That's basically letting me know that I don't have any rinse aid or jet dry in this compartment, it's empty. That's what the light is indicating. Once you would put Rinzade or jet dry in here, this light would go away. The intake and drain light here, this would let you know if there would be a problem or an issue with the intake or the water line coming into the dishwasher or the drain line, the water line going away from the dishwasher. So it's basically um, a diagnostic light letting you know if there's any issue with the water line coming in or the water line going out. And you'll also see there's a PC light here. This PC light, basically it's for if the technician from Mealy 
would come to try to troubleshoot the dishwasher and figure out what the issue is with it. He can count the number of blanks that this light gives off and it would exactly tell him what the issue is with the dishwasher. So, so anyway, I have, I have it set on normal. My dishes are in here, I put my soap in. So then to start it, all I'm gonna do is just shut the, shut the dishwasher and that's gonna start the dishwasher. When the dishwasher is done running, it'll actually beep to let you know that it's finished. So, um, your water shutoffs for your dishwasher and your kitchen sink are going to be located right underneath your kitchen sink here. So, underneath here, you'll notice on the back wall that on the left hand side, there's two valves. This on the left side is your hot water supply. And the reason there's two valves is because one's supplying hot water up to your kitchen sink and the other is supplying hot water down to your dishwasher. And you'll also notice on the right side there's one valve or one line coming out of the wall and this is your cold water supply, only supplying cold water up to your kitchen sink. The dishwasher does not get cold water, it only gets hot water. So that's why there's two valves in your hot water line. So anyway, if you would see a leak or water leaking from this area, from your kitchen sink or your dishwasher, and you're not sure what it caused, you know, what caused the leak, if you would shut these valves, turn them to the right, you would close these, and you would shut the water off to your dishwasher and your sink, and you would stop the leak, essentially. So that's where your water shutoff valves are for you sink in your dishwasher. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, countertops. Countertops in the home are a limestone countertop. So one thing with limestone is a lot of people are very familiar with granite. Limestone is very different. Limestone is more porous and it's easier to stain. So you have to be very careful with uh, spilling foods on it that are, that are acidic in nature. And when I say acidic foods, I'm talking about things like tomato sauce, lemon juice, lime juice, wine, alcohol, um, things like that. If you leave it set on this countertop too long, it can cause a stain in the countertop. So an example would be if you had a wine glass and you have wine spilled around the end of it, and you let that wine glass sit here for an extended period of time, it could essentially put a ring in the countertop. So you want to make sure you use coasters, um, trivets, things like that. And if you do spill anything on it, you just want to make sure you clean it up, you know, in a timely manner. Um, one thing that you do want to use when you clean this is you have to use a cleaner that is specially made for cleaning natural stone, such as limestone. Now, I believe Gary here, he bought a cleaner um, that is safe to use um, for natural stone and all you do is just spray it on and wipe it up with a paper towel, which is fine. Um, there's a lot of cleaners out there that you can purchase for natural stone. Uh, some other cleaners other, other than this one is a 409 natural stone cleaner that's safe to use on this. So you can buy that at um, pretty much any hardware store, even grocery stores such as ShopRite would sell 409 natural stone cleaner. So, um, trying to think what else with this stuff. Did you want me to get into about sealing it or is that something? No, okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sprinklers and the fire, smoke detectors, things like that. So you'll notice the home has sprinklers all throughout. You'll see the sprinklers in your kitchen, on the walls. You also even notice there's sprinklers, even inside the closets, there's sprinklers as well. Now, sprinklers can be set off two different ways. One way is the red piece of glass that's located in the sprinkler. If you break this red piece of glass, it'll set it off. So an example would be like a kid in here throwing a ball around. If he throws a ball hard enough and breaks that piece of glass, it'll set it off. Another example would be, let's say the movers moving furniture in. Let's say they're moving in a mattress in through the hallway and they 
pump the mattress into the sprinkler located in the hallway there. If they hit it hard enough, they can set the sprinkler off. So you just want to be aware of where they're located and make sure you don't hit them or bump them and break that red glass because that will set them off. The other way a sprinkler sets off is by temperature. Smoke does not set off a sprinkler, only temperature. If the temperature gets over 155 degrees, that glass essentially is going to expand and break, and that's what triggers the sprinkler to uh, start shooting out water. Now, the other thing with sprinklers is they're individualized. In other words, it's not like the movies. In the movies, the sprinklers go off in the whole building or in the whole home. It's not like that. They're individualized. So, for instance, if I have a fire that is right here, and this sprinkler gets 155 degrees, this is the only sprinkler that's going to go off for now. If the fire then would travel over into the kitchen, and this sprinkler would get 155 degrees, then that one would pop and set off. So, if a sprinkler sets off in your home or anywhere in a building, it's automatically going to bring the fire department. They're automatically going to come to the building and they're going to know exactly which home the sprinkler set off at. The alarm that you're going to hear is through your announce meter located on the wall right here. This is essentially like a speaker box. So that loud annoying noise is going to come out through that announce meter right there. The smoke detector is in your home. You'll see you have a smoke detector located on the wall here. This is actually a smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector combination. It is hardwired electrically, so its main source of power is from electrical wire, but it has a battery backup in case the electric went out in the building. So batteries do go bad over time, so if the battery does get low, it'll actually beep and say low battery. That's how you know it's a low battery. To change the battery in the smoke detector, all you're going to do is you're going to grab a hold of it, give it a quarter turn, and pull it straight off the wall. And then there's a little wire on the back you're going to have to unplug. And then you'll be able to take the whole thing down completely and access the back where the battery is. It's just like changing the battery in remote control. It's a 9 volt battery. So Now smoke detectors in your home. If a smoke detector goes off, it does not bring the fire department and it does not let anybody else in the building know. So it doesn't evacuate the building or anything like that. So if it sets off, it's just going to be really loud and annoying and it's just letting you know that, hey, there's smoke in your home or carbon monoxide in your home. So one question I get a lot of times is, what should I do if I'm cooking and I burn some toast or burn some food while I'm cooking and I set off the smoke detector? Well, if you do accidentally burn some toast and set off the smoke detector, there's no need to panic. The fire department's not going to come kicking down the front door. All you want to do is open up the window and try to get the smoke out through the window. Once the smoke dissipates, the smoke detector will shut off automatically. The last thing you want to do if you do create smoke by, say, burning some toast accidentally, do not open up the front door. The reason I say that is because there's smoke detectors out in the hallway. And if you open up the front door and let the smoke go out into the hallway, if you set off those smoke detectors, that will bring the fire department. So if you make, if you, again, if you make some smoke by burning some toast or something accidentally, try to get it out through your windows, try to, let, try to air it out the home that way. So, um, what else do we got here? I touched base on this outlet here with the red dot, this is a switched outlet, so if you would have something plugged into this top outlet here, you'd be able to, like say a lamp or something, you'd be able to turn the lamp on and off with the switch that corresponds with the red dot on the wall over here. You also have a teledata jack, you have a phone connection, a ethernet or cat5 connection, and then there's also two RG6 lines as well. Um, the reason there's two RG6 lines is because we do offer satellite in the building. So it's DirecTV, that's the satellite provider. So if you would decide to get um, DirecTV, you could also then get internet. That's why there's, uh, there's, two, there's two RG6 lines. So. Oh, 
And speaking of um, speaking of TV, phone, internet, you actually have a choice between three providers. Um, you can choose between Verizon FiOS, Comcast, or DirecTV. So um, when you decide which provider you want to get your phone, internet, TV, whatever you want to whatever you want to choose, um, you give one of those providers a call. They'll come here to the building and they'll set everything up through your media panel, which is located here in your closet. They open up these panels here for you. So the media panel is located in here. The top box is the Verizon box. That right there is actually your fiber optics coming into your home. And then the bottom box is where it converts over into copper and goes into the teledata jacks in the home. So you really don't have to know anything about these boxes other than when the cable guy shows up, you just have to point him in this direction. He's just gonna need access to these boxes when he connects some. Um, you know, or hooks up your service. So, what I also recommend to uh, some homeowners is, you know, if you don't, if you are going to get wireless internet and don't want the wireless router sitting out by a desk somewhere, you can get the wireless router put in the box here. There is power outlets in here, so they can locate them in here. It's just neater, cleaner. So. Windows. Windows in the home are going to simply open and close. To open them, you're going to turn the handle out and then just push. That's going to open the window. And then to close them, you're just going to pull the handle to the end and then turn it to lock it. Now, this is all the further the window is open. This is four inches. That's what code requires. And then the same thing with the windows located here. Same thing. Turn the handle and just push straight up. Okay, heating and air conditioning. So, this is your heating and air conditioning unit. It's basically ran off of this thermostat, which is located right here. So, this thermostat is basically controlling the heating and air conditioning for your entire home. So, the way it works is this bottom panel here, this is your return. So the air essentially is getting sucked in through here. It's going through the filter, converting into hot or cold air, depending on what you have it set on with your thermostat. It is blowing the hot or cold air out the top here. So it's just recirculating is what it's like. Now the filter, which you see in here, the filter you would want to change once every six months, and you can actually get these filters at the front desk. They're about three dollars a filter, I believe, or somewhere around there. So they do have these filters available at the front desk. So. Now the thermostat, which is located here, you'll see the bottom button of your thermostat where it says auto and on. This is your fan button. So your fan button is basically going to tell the fan either you only want to turn the fan on if it's calling for heat or cool air. If you put this on on, it's just gonna spin the fan all the time and waste electric. So basically, you always want to leave this bottom button on auto all the time. You'd never wanna put this on on because it's just gonna waste electric is what it's gonna do. The top button here, this is really your control button. So this top button, I could turn the unit off. So right now, if you see here, I have the unit off. And I also know that because it's gonna shut off completely. And I can move this over to heat. And I also know it's on heat because if you see in this bottom right hand corner, there's a little fire flame flashing here. That's how I know it's on heat. So if I, want to adjust or set the heat, I can do so by moving this button, the arrows, basically. So let's say I want to set the heat to 68 degrees. So I put it to 68 and then I hit set. I can also move this to cool 
And I know it's on cool because if I see here in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little snowflake flashing here in the bottom right hand corner. That's how I know it's on air conditioning. So let's say I want to set the air conditioning to, let's say 74. So I set the air conditioning to 74. Now, the auto feature up top, what that's for is, auto is going to keep it between, it's going to actually do both heat and cool. So when I had it over on heat, I set it to 68. And then when I put it to cool, I set it to 74. And if I do auto, it's going to keep it between, between 68 and 74. So the only thing with auto is you have to have at least a four degree difference between your heat and your cool. Otherwise, the thermostat gets confused and it doesn't know what to do. So, um, the other thing with the thermostat or with the heat pump is there is a reset button located inside here. And basically, the reset button, just like a computer, every now and then it needs reset. So, if anyone would ever tell you to reset your heat pump, what they're saying to do is basically with this switch here, it looks like a light switch located here. They're asking you just to turn it off or down and then flip it back up or on. So basically you just reset the heat pump is what you did. So um, Alright, so let's talk a little bit about the hardwood floor in the home. Hardwood floor in the home is white oak. So just like with any hardwood floor, it is wood. So water and wood do not mix well. So you do not want to use a wet mop on the floor. Um, basically, what we recommend to use is a product um, called Bruce Hardwood Floor Cleaner. Or you can also use another product called Zep Hardwood Floor Cleaner. Um, both can be bought at like a Home Depot or Lowe's. So it comes with a little spray bottle and a little Swiffer mop like with a terry cloth towel over the mop head. So it's safe for engineered wood floors. Um, these floors do come pre-finished with a polyurethane finish. So you do not want to put any wax-based products on it or any products with a polish or polyurethane in them. All you want to do is just use a cleaner. That's it. So, and the Bruce Harbaugh Floor Cleaner and the Zeth Harbaugh Floor Cleaner are safe to use for this floor. If you would happen to spill any water on the floor, you want to clean it up as quickly as possible. Um, it could make a difference in, you know, in saving the wood floor or the wood floor being totally ruined. So if you do spill water, clean it up immediately. Um, the other thing we also advise is getting like an area rug or runners in high traffic areas just to help with protection. Obviously, no shoes helps as well. Um, if you have any pets, uh, keeping like claws trimmed on, on like large dogs obviously um, will help keep the scratches off the floor. Um, if you vacuum the floor, the type of vacuum you use, you want to make sure that the beater bar, the beater bar is the bristles that spin around on the vacuum, you want to make sure that they're raised off the floor and not hitting the floor. If they're hitting the floor, essentially all they're going to be doing is putting little scratches in the floor. So just make sure that you do have the beater bar on the vacuum raised, because all you really want the vacuum to do is just to suck up the dirt and the dust. That's really all you want it to do. So, um, so that was floor, countertops. Let's see what they cover here. Closets. Another, um, another thing with the closets is you'll notice the closets in the hallway here, this is a dummy handle. In other words, it does not pull down. The ultimate, you're just pulling straight out. A lot of people have a tendency, they grab a hold of this handle and they want to pull down to open it and end up breaking it off. So just make sure that you're just pulling it straight down and pushing it straight out. It's just going to roll and catch. Coming into the washer and dryer. So your washer and dryer is located here. The top unit is your dryer and the bottom unit is your washer. So basically, to clean the lint out of the lint screen, your lint's gonna get trapped in here 
and you just open it up like so to clean the lint out. If you, if you notice, this dryer is a ventless dryer. It doesn't vent outside the building. So because it's a ventless dryer, it has a filter that you need to clean. Um, basically, the average person probably does about maybe three loads of laundry a week, three, four loads maybe, tops. So someone who's using it average three, four loads a week, you probably want to clean the filter out every two or three months. So to clean your filter, you're going to open it by pushing down on this tab, and this door opens, and then moving the blue tabs, or unlocking the blue tabs, and you'll be able to pull out this little stopper here. Now when you pull out this, this stopper here, you might get a little bit of water in here. It might come out. So what I usually do is just get a paper towel or a rag just to clean up some of the water that's sitting here. And then the filter that you're actually going to clean is this right here. Now this filter lasts forever. You don't ever have to buy a new one. All you're going to do is take this filter into the bathtub and just run water all down through all these slots and all these holes. And you're just going to be washing out some very fine lint that gets trapped in the filter here. That's all you're going to be doing. After you wash it, clean it out good, you're just going to shake it, let it dry. And once it's dry, you're just going to stick it right back in here. And then put your other compartment back in. Make sure you lock the blue tabs. And then close it like so. If you ever notice that your dryer is not getting your clothes very dry, chances are the filter needs clean. That's usually what the issue is. Um, the other thing with the dryer is you'll notice up top here, so for instance, let's say I want to run the dryer, so I'll turn it on, and basically I'm telling it I want my clothes extra dry. You can tell it, you can say very dry, regular dry, damp dry, whatever you want to say. But you'll notice it comes up two hours and seven minutes here, which seems like a very long time for drying. Now, it does not run for two hours and seven minutes. So let's start it here. And the reason I say that is because there's a moisture sensor located inside the dryer. And about every four or five minutes, it's going to take a reading of how wet the clothes are inside the dryer. And that moisture sensor is then going to automatically adjust the time up top here until you get your clothes extra dry, basically. So for instance, right now, I don't have anything in the dryer. In about five minutes, the dryer is going to realize, hey, I am extra dry. And it's going to shut off automatically. So a common mistake people make is they see two hours and seven minutes, and they try to overload the dryer with too many clothes and it actually works against you. It actually can't work efficiently because if you overload it, the air can't pass through your clothes and can't get them dry. So don't be, um, don't be fooled by this time when it first comes up here. So usually what I tell people is when you put your clothes in a dryer, don't fill it more than about half to two thirds full. So you'll see, you'll be able to know what half is because if you look in the back, there's a little center knob in the back. That's the halfway point. So about two thirds of the way is about the max you want to fill it. That way, when the drum's spinning, the air can pass through your clothes, and the more efficient it's going to be able to dry your clothes. The other thing that helps too with the efficiency of the dryer is if you keep the door open, the more air that can circulate in through here, the more efficient it's going to work. You don't have to keep the door open, but from an efficiency standpoint, it does work better. So, the washing machine, which is on the bottom here, this is your soap compartment right here. So the two lines on the left, this is where you're going to put your detergent in this compartment right here. So you're just going to fill it right in the cap of the, uh, of the bottle and dump the cap right in here. The flower, which you see in the center, this is where you're going to put your fabric softener, your liquid fabric softener, if you decide to use liquid, liquid fabric softener. And the single line on the right here, you could, you could put bleach or extra soap in this compartment. 
Personally, I don't ever use this compartment. Um, the difference between the single line and the double line is basically this double line is not going to release the soap into the washing machine until after it fills up with water. And the single line, it's just going to go straight down in before it fills up with water. So most people don't want soap added until, um, until their clothes are wet and it can mix throughout the clothes um, very well. So personally, I just put my soap in here uh, and fabric softener in this one and I don't really use that one. So. Um, when you turn the machine on, so we'll turn it over to cotton here, and when I press the start button, the click you just heard, that's going to lock the door. So right now the door is locked, it's not going to allow me to open it, and that's because it's filling up with water. Obviously the computer knows, hey, I'm filling up with water, don't open the door. So let's say I did want to open up the door. Um, even when I turn this back to off, the computer still knows it has water in here and it's not gonna unlock that door. It's gonna keep that door locked. So if the door would ever lock on you and you would need to open it, what you're gonna do is turn this knob down to drain. It takes one minute to run it through a drain cycle. So we'll run it through a drain cycle here. Once it runs through the drain cycle, then the computer will realize, hey, I'm safe, I can open the door, and it'll unlock the door for you. So, and then you see up top here, the dryer, like I was saying, it shut off automatically because it realizes it is, it is extra dry. There's nothing wet inside there. So you can see it went from two hours and seven minutes down to zero in about four or five minutes of time. So that's the moisture sensor adjusting the time. Um, the other thing is the type of soap you use, you'll see very important with the washing machine, you have to use high efficiency soap. When you go to the uh, grocery store or wherever you buy detergent at, um, you'll, see, you'll see all the tie lined up in the grocery store. Make sure you, you look for this HE um, on your detergent. Basically high efficiency soap must be used for all front load washing machines. So obviously this is a front load washing machine so you have to use the high efficiency soap. And then after I ran it through the drain cycle, then the door unlocks because the computer knows it has no more water inside and it allows me to open the door. Okay, in the bathroom here. So in the bathroom here, you have two light switches located here. One's gonna operate the medicine cabinet lights, and the other is gonna operate the light over the shower. Now you'll notice there is a fan located in the bathroom, but there's no switch for the fan. The fan is running all the time, constantly. It's actually located on the roof of the building, constantly drawing air in through the in through the vent so there is no way to turn it on and off it's constantly drawing air in through it so the shower you're going to turn the shower on by simply turning the handle to the side and if you want the shower to come out the top you're going to press this the burner button right here in and that's going to create the water to come out the top like so obviously you got to remember you need a shower curtain for your, for your bathtub as well. Now, another important thing, if you do take a shower or run the shower, do not pull this out while the shower is running. If you want to turn the shower off, turn the water off. Don't pull the diverter out while there's still water coming out of the shower head, or else it'll break. So, if you wanted to take a bath in here to fill the tub up with water, you're going to push down on the drain cap located here. If you look on the drain cap, one side says open, the other side says closed. So you're just going to push down where it says closed, that's going to fill it up. And then if you wanted to drain it, you just push where it says open, and that's going to open it back up. So Your medicine cabinet located here, the doors are going to just open up simply by pulling on them like that. 
the panel to the left here, this panel does not come off. This is your electrical work for your lighting. So this panel does not come off, it stays in place. You do have glass shelves in here, so just be careful again with your glass shelves. Your sink is going to turn on simply by pushing the handle up, and you're going to have hot water to the left and cold water to the right. And you can also fill your sink up by pressing down on the sink drain. That's going to fill it up with water. And pressing it again is going to release it and let it drain. So. Your water shutoffs for your bathroom sink are underneath the vanity here. You'll notice in the back wall, there's a valve on the left and a valve on the right. The valve on the left is your hot water supply, and the valve on the right is your cold water supply. So if you ever see a leak coming from your bathroom sink, if you would close those valves, that would stop the water from, from leaking. So it's very important to know where your water shutoffs are. Your toilet located here. Now the toilet, it is water, or water saving. So when you flush the toilet, you're going to have to hold the handle down for about two to three seconds to get a good vortex in the toilet. The other thing is with your toilet is there's a water shutoff valve located in the back corner here. Again, very important to know if you would ever see a leak or any water leaking from your toilet, you could shut the water valve off here and that would stop the water coming to, to your toilet. So Your bathroom door is going to lock. If you, if you want to come on the inside, make sure the lock is. It is going to lock with this pin right here. So to lock it, I'm just going to push in on the pin, and that's going to lock the door. Now to unlock it, I can do two things. I can either pull the pin back out, or I can just press down on the handle on the inside. That'll unlock it. Now you'll notice there's a hole on the outside here. There is no special key for the door if someone would get themselves locked in. Basically, all you need to do is stick something small enough in this hole to push the pin back out the other side. That's all you have to do. So, all right. Your electric panel. This is your electric panel. Very important to know where the electric panel is um, for a couple reasons. First and foremost, being for safety. If you would ever, for any reason, need to shut the power off in your home, you can do so by shutting it off here at your electric panel. So, if you need to shut the power off, so everything's labeled, you'll see here 13579, 13579, 246810, 246810, and it tells you which number it corresponds with. So, like for instance, number nine is general lighting. So, I shut off the general lighting. So very important to know where, where your um, breakers are. So um, The other thing is, if you ever realize something electrically is not working in your home and you don't think it's um, a light bulb out or anything like that, it could be as simple as just checking the electric panel here. It could be, it could be a breaker just tripped and you just might need to turn it back on. So. That's another, um, that's another good reason to know where your electric panel is. Your front entry door, located here. Now your front entry door, you'll see there's a lock here, a deadbolt lock here, and then there's also a hotel lock here as well. So, now the other thing with your entry door is, when you leave for the day, you have to stick your key in this outside lock to lock the door. The door does not automatically lock behind you. So you can't lock yourself out unless you actually lock the door on the outside. So. Um, so let's talk about, I skipped over the stone care, a little bit of cleaning and stuff here in the bathroom. I skipped over that part. So in your bathroom here, Basically, all the stone in the bathroom, the tile in the shower, the vanity top here, the tile behind the vanity top, is all marble. So you're going to want to clean this with 
Again, sort of the same cleaner you would use um, for the for the limestone countertop out in the kitchen. You don't want to use um, any super harsh like cleaners with like like a CRL with a lot of bleach in it, things like that. You don't want to use on this on this um, on this stone. Your floor in here, this is porcelain. You could clean your floor with any cleaner. This is porcelain, it's a man-made stone. You're, you're not going to hurt it. You can use any tile cleaner, um, pretty much, you know, Tile X, uh, um, you, you know, Mr. Clean makes a tile cleaner. That'd be safe all to use on this floor here. Um, now in the shower, you'll notice um, the back wall of the shower here, it's a chiseled marble. It's rough, and a lot of people ask, well, how can I clean this? Because it is a rough surface, and it will get it will get some soap scum and, and some mildew build up in this. The best way to clean this is by using a plastic bristle brush to scrub this. Obviously, a sponge isn't going to get this clean because it's not a smooth surface. So you need like a you need like a scrub brush to scrub it to get it clean. Um, again, you can use a mild a mild tile cleaner with a scrub brush to keep this nice and clean. Um, so, and I'm trying to think what else cleaning is in here. I mean, pretty much all your other products in here, like your, your toilet, your sink, your bathtub, you can use like a, like a Mr. Clean um, cleaner to clean all this stuff. It's all, it's all porcelain um, and fiberglass, so it's safe to use those products for. So, obviously, Windex on the mirrors and then glass inside the cabin here, Windex as well. Um, let's see if I missed anything I have here. Oh, uh, the vent in the ceiling here. This vent is basically an exhaust, so it's constantly drawing air up and out of the home is what that is what this vent is doing. So some people ask what, what this is for as well. Um, let's see if I missed anything. Oh, one thing I did miss. One other thing, very important thing. Gas shut off for the, um, for the cooktop. If you would need to shut the gas off for any reason, there's a shut off valve located in the cabinet here on the back wall. And you'll see there's a red tag here on it as well. If you would turn that yellow knob and shut the gas off, that would stop the gas going to the cooktop here. So, if you, if, obviously if you do smell gas, or have a leak, you think you have a leak in your home, obviously you want to let um, the front desk know, because that's, that's an emergency. Uh, they're going to need to get the fire department here and me and me to figure out what's going on, because it could be a serious hazard. So, But it's also very important to know where the gas shut off is as well. So. Um, Cleaning of cabinets. I don't know if I talked about the cleaning of cabinets, but Gary has a Windex here, um, which is safe to use for the cabinets. Windex paper towel, it's more than safe to use on your cabinet, on all the cabinets, from the glass in the back here to the front of it. So Windex is okay to use on the cabinets. So, um, trying to think what else. As far as the property management company for the building, um, Wentworth Property Management is the property manager. Mark Stapleton, he's the head property manager. Mark Stapleton's here uh, Monday through Friday, normal business hours. Um, the building has 24 hour, seven concierge service, so there's always staff here. And there's also a, a super who lives lives uh, in the building as well. So in case of an emergency, you know, you need the water shut off to the entire building because something catastrophic is happening. There is someone here who's able to do that. Um, now, Wentworth Property Management, they're going to be responsible for everything from your front door out. So all the common areas, any issues in the common areas, is going to be Wentworth Property Management. Um, for instance, if um, if you have a delivery of furniture, if you are moving in, you need to coordinate that with number of property management. Um, if someone's part 
parked in your parking space. That's fine with property management. If um, if you have guests coming and you want to allow them access into the unit, that's fine with property management. If there's an issue out by the pool, that's fine with property management. If your neighbor is blasting their stereo at a thousand decibels at three o'clock in the morning, that's fine with property management. So that's basically. Um, those type of issues you want to go, you're going to want to go to the property management company. Um, 